Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 says, For in Him, it's, the context is Christ, in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So the contrast between them, Adam had the image, but Jesus Christ is the full um, revelation of God, of the Godhead. Second, Adam came to a paradise and earth without sin. Christ came to an exceedingly sinful earth. The difference, uh, what sin can do and the contrast between them. Adam came to perfection. Jesus Christ came to mass imperfection, but to set things right. Praise the Lord, He's going to. Amen. Isn't it good to know you're on the winning side? Amen. I mean, I like that. I like knowing that, that we have the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ and that God has taken care of it. That is a great comfort to us to know that it's not, we're not in some epic battle of good versus evil and we hope good triumphs. No, good has already won. It was, de, evil was defeated at the cross. Um, God's got it well under control. Um, it doesn't mean that there won't be some trials and tribulations that we go through in this life. Uh, but again, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. We're pilgrims here. And our eyes are to be on the Lord and to, to a, a coming city that's, that we get to be a part of. That's where our focus is to be. That's why we're to forget those things which are behind and, and look forward unto those things which are before and keep our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. We press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's what we're to do. That's where our focus is to stay because He's the reward. He's the prize that we get. So we focus on Him because He's the one that's going to set everything straight. All right. I like this. While Adam was asleep, his bride was formed. We, we know that, that a deep sleep fell on him, and then um, a rib was taken, and he was formed. The lamb's bride was formed by his death. So a sleep was put on Adam, but the lamb's bride was formed by his death, which is death is a term for, or, or sleep is a term for death. You can see the, the contrast there, the comparison. All right. Number four, after his sin, Adam hid from God in Genesis 3.8. After he became sin, Christ presented himself to God. He became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. All right, Adam blamed Eve for his sin. And Christ, his own self, took our sins upon his body on the cross. And there's references we could look at. I hope this is sounding familiar. We may turn to some of them. But Adam blamed Eve for his sin. He blamed the bride. Okay, Christ did not do that. He took our sins on Him, and He redeemed us. The contrast now. We've looked at the, the comparison. Now we're looking at the contrast. Adam's sin brought a curse to the ground. Christ's sacrifice for sin made it possible for the curse to be removed. Amen. Thank God for that. I praise the Lord when that day comes. Um, I'm looking forward to ruling and reigning with Him, Lord willing, in the thousand-year millennial reign and just seeing the, the lion lay down with the lamb children playing on the hole of an asp. Isaiah talks about that. I'm looking forward to seeing those things and getting to be a part of that, that world and, and see how everything works itself out. That's going to be amazing. But Christ's sacrifice for sin made it possible for the curse to be removed. Number seven, an innocent animal had to be slain for Adam. Um, this is implied in the coats of skin that God gave him. You can't take an animal's coat without killing it. So there was a sacrifice made to cover sin. I hope we see the, the picture of that there. Um, it was covering their nakedness, which was representative of their sin. And that sacrifice had to be made. Blood had to be shed in order for their sin to be covered. All right. But Christ became the innocent Lamb of God for us. So an innocent animal had to be slain for Adam, but Christ was the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Number eight, Adam's life ended, but Christ lives forever. Amen. 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 The contrast, the differences between the two. Now, the seed of the woman. God promised that a man would come who would be injured by Satan, but who would destroy Satan ultimately. And where do we find that at? Where, do, where is that found in the Bible? That's right, Genesis 3.15. All right. Um, the man that was is to come at the time it was written or was stated would injure Satan. Um would be injured by Satan, I'm sorry, but would destroy Satan ultimately. Jesus Christ was bruised on the cross, but it was only a heel wound because he rose from the dead. It was only temporary. All right, through Christ's death, Satan destruct, Satan's destruction is guaranteed. Uh, thank God for that. His destruction is guaranteed. That's why I say we're on the winning side. It's already 
taken care of. We, we have won. The fact that Jesus would be the seed of, the, of a woman instead of a man foretold his virgin birth as well, by the way. Okay, just the fact that he would be the seed of a woman instead of a man foretold his virgin birth. You can see there's a lot of things that are taught there. Let's look at Abel's offering. Let's go to Genesis chapter 4. All right, Abel's offering, Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell." So we see Abel's offering. It was an offering of an innocent substitute, which is very closely allied with what is said of the Lord in Isaiah chapter 53, where it says, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of man, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Now get this. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. So, <clears throat> Abel's offering was an innocent substitute. And Christ took upon us, upon himself, our sin. Abel's offering was one of blood and death. Um, the contrast in Genesis 4 is between Cain and Abel. Cain brought forth of the fruit of the ground, and Abel brought forth a blood offering. Um, again, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. The, the blood has to be shed. Uh, now, what Abel was exercising there is he was exercising faith in what God had told him and what God had expressed to his parents, and I believe they had more... Um, interaction with God than the Bible gives us because they had an idea that they needed to take this proper offering and Cain's was not accepted. I don't think God just said, figure it out and I hope you get it right. I personally do not believe that because that's not how God has worked. Um, I believe God shared with them what they needed to do and they knew um, how to do it and everything. So Abel's exercised faith in the promise of the Redeemer, the Messiah to come. He trusted God and did what God said by faith. He might not have fully understood it all. I doubt he did. Because as we look at the Bible, it's given to us through what is known as progressive revelation. At this point, they didn't know very much. We are more blessed today because we know more than Abel ever did. But Abel's in the hall of faith because he believed what God had told him. See, and that's what faith is. It's, it's believing what God tells you and acting on it. And that's what we see Abel doing. He believed what God said to the point that it altered his, his actions, the things that he did. That's faith. That's what faith is. And that's what we need, the same thing. We can have the same type of faith that Abel had. We can read what God says and we can obey it. That's what God is looking for. It's that simple. When we see it, we just begin to implement it in our life. We do it. When we mess up, we, we get things right. And that's even part of what that offering was. It, it's saying here, I'm sorry, God, forgive me for my sin that I've sinned against you. And I'm, I'm giving this offering as, you know, a picture of the covering of my sin, the, the blood that will, will forgive my sin. And that's what they're doing. So there's repentance also in that. So Abel's offering was one of blood and death. Abel's offering was made by faith. I just dealt with that in Hebrews 11, 4. You could see that. And Abel's offering was not of works. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Abel's offering exposed the error of false religion. Okay, um, let's turn real quick to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. Because the contrast is given in Genesis chapter 4 and also here in Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, verse 4, it says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, 
by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. So it says, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. By what did he obtain witness that he was righteous? You all tell me. What did he do that he obtained witness that he was righteous? Let me read the verse again. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. The sacrifice, you both got it right. Yes, it was the sacrifice that he offered. It was through that that he obtained witness that he was righteous. Or as James puts it in James chapter 2, that faith without works is dead being alone. That's the same thing that's being said right here. Is the fact that he had faith and everyone's like, well, it's, it's all about faith. It's all about faith. Okay, but real faith can be seen. Real faith will obtain witness that it's real. Again, the parachute example. I can say I believe a parachute will save my life, but I don't, you don't know that I truly believe that until you see me put it on and jump. That's when you know that guy really believes that. He really believes that parachute will save his life. That's when you know. That's when I obtain witness that you all have seen it and say, okay, I believe him now. I believe what he's saying because I saw it. That's what this is saying because he did what God said. That's how everybody knew it was real. See, when people just talk about faith and they say, well, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I do. This is how I live. This is what I believe. Great. Praise the Lord. I'm glad to hear people say things like that. Seriously, that's a good thing. We should uh, uh, verbalize what we believe and where we stand in our positions. But nobody ultimately knows that that's truly what we believe until we live it. Until we live it. So when somebody tells you all this stuff about, oh, praise God, I believe this about God and Jesus is so great in my life and, and Jesus is amazing, God's amazing, and, and I just love Jesus, but you don't see it lived out in their life, you know that they are lying to you. Amen. You know that they are lying to you. They may, in fact, be lying to themselves. Amen. That is a real, very real possibility. Most of the time, I think that's the case. I don't think they're purposely trying to lie and deceive everybody. I think most of the time, they believe it. Because that's the danger of religion. And having a religious experience without truly being born again. Or you can truly be saved, but you're not living what you say you believe. Because it hasn't been tested yet. And a great example that is before us today is everything going on with our governor shutting down churches or attempting to. Here's one of the good things and bad things about being a preacher is you say a lot of stuff. You influence people. You give your opinion a lot. Every preacher, people are going to say, well, no, they're to preach the Bible. I'm like, are you kidding me? Anything I say outside of me reading the actual words of Scripture is really my opinion, okay, of what the Amen. Bible says. I mean, hopefully it's true to what the Bible says. That's what we want. But, it, but it's not the words of Scripture. That's right. So preachers are going to say a lot of things. But you're going to know where they really stand when it comes down to it when they're tested. Amen. Now... I don't expect any preacher to be perfect. Preachers are going to misspeak. Okay, they're going to say things that if, because I've even gone back and listened to messages I've preached, and I'm like, I, well, I said that? I was like, that's not right. Any preacher that preaches for any amount of time, that's going to happen. Because it's hard to always keep all of your thoughts exactly where they should be, and you just, maybe you don't clarify something as good as you should or something like that. I get that's going to happen. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about... Preachers saying that we're going to stand and persecution comes, we're going to stand and, and we just believe the Bible and we're going to stand on the Word of God and then it comes down to it and they don't do it. Like That tells me right there that they're lying. They're lying. 
Their faith is not real. They say they have faith in the Word of God. They have faith in God, but they bow down as soon as the government says you can't practice your faith as you see it. And again, I've told you, if you go to any preacher that's canceled his services and you ask him, did you cancel because the governor said or because God led you? They're going to say, well, God led me. Not one of them is going to say I'm a compromiser and, and I'm afraid of the governor. I'm afraid of Jezebel and I'm going to go run and hide. Not one of them is going to say that. Okay, I don't even think Elijah would have said that. Amen. Okay. He just said, I just wanted to get out of there because it was a stressful situation. I just wanted to be by myself. Okay, but God tells us what really went down. But you're going to see people's faith really lived out. And yes, I did compare our governor to Jezebel. Just in case you're wondering, I absolutely did. Amen. And, and that's where these preachers are at. They're, they're afraid. And the faith that they've been professing for so long, and I, again, I don't know every single one of them, but most preachers are like, no, we need to stand. We're not going to let government tell us what to do. There's separation of church and state. They folded on it. They don't truly believe it. And I'll give you more evidence to that fact. Is just, at least on my Facebook page and the, the friends that I have on Facebook, a, a lot of the preachers that I'm friends with are putting that, you know, you can add to your profile picture and put church is essential. And I know many of them that are doing that that are putting that, changing their profile picture to that, but they're not having services. I'm like, well, if you think it's essential, then why aren't you having services? Because we ought to obey God rather than men. So if you believe it's essential and you believe it's safe to go back now, why aren't you, you coward? Amen. That's what I believe. That's where I'm at. I, okay, maybe at first... We didn't know everything. We were getting all kinds of crazy information about the coronavirus and, and how deadly it was and fine. But now we've seen. Now we have some data that we can look at. And this thing is not anywhere near as deadly as everybody thought it was. As the experts told us it was. So now we know that the death rate really is in comparison to the seasonal flu. And we don't freak out and panic over the flu. So why are we over this? But it's just more proof that our faith must be lived out and what we truly believe in our heart is what we do. It will be evidenced. See, Abel obtained witness. How? By the offering. That's right, by the sacrifice that he made. That's how he obtained witness. So his offering was made by faith. It was not of works. It's in contrast to what Cain did. Okay, the Bible in Jude, I believe, calls it the way of Cain. And it's a works-based religion. Cain brought forth of the fruit of the ground, his labor, his work that he did. But it was bloodless. That's man-made religion. That is man-made religion. That's what that is. That's the Catholic Church saying, well, we're going to, you know, we're going to have the Eucharist. And this is the physical body and blood of Christ. The Eucharist is the physical body. The, the wine is the, the physical blood of Christ. That's a bloodless sacrifice, by the way. I mean, that's just man-made religion is all it is. Their Jesus is still on the cross. And by the way, the, the, the Jesus of the Catholic Church is not the Jesus of the Bible. Amen. It is not the Jesus of the Bible. God saw fit to warn us of false Christs, okay, that would be preached. And the Jesus of the Catholic Church is not the Jesus of the Bible. We, we cannot compromise on that. Like my God that the Bible tells me about, that God tells me about, is not still on the cross. I don't have the power through some magical incantation spoken in Latin to bring Jesus down into the elements of what we call the Lord's Supper, they call it the Eucharist. But that's what they do. They say this magical incantation in Latin, and all of a sudden, that, that, that bread and that wine is magically transformed into the physical body and blood of Jesus Christ.
there is a book, I cannot remember the title right now. It's by, uh, I believe he was French, and he was a former priest. His name was Charles Chiniqui. Um, and I cannot remember the title of the book. It's on chick.com. Jack Chick, if you're going to look it up. Um, but anyway, in there he describes that this was in the 1800s, and he describes when they would bring, the Catholic Church would bring the host out, which is the Eucharist, the, what we call the Lord's Supper, what they've perverted, but he, they'd bring it out and go down the street, and they'd make a big procession of it, and they would require people to bow down. Why? Because they believed it was truly God in the flesh, that they called Him down, and they would require people to bow down. If not, if you, this was on through through the dark ages as well, you know, what we call the the Counter-Reformation, 15, 16, 17, 1800s, this stuff is going on, that if you didn't bow down, they knew to take them, arrest them, and we're going to torture them. We're going to question them, whatever, because why didn't you bow down when God came before you? And that was a way to you know, find out people that believe the Bible and said, I'm not bowing down to that. That's not God. And they'd get busted. But this is, that is what the Catholic Church teaches. That's what they believe is that it's the physical body and blood of Jesus Christ. They are calling God down. They get to command God, and they do it every day. Every Catholic church does it every day. And they, they have the Mass, and they call Him down every single day. They have the authority to do that, to command God to come down from heaven and be in that, the host. That's what they teach. I'm sorry, that's not the God of the Bible. That is not the God of the Bible. That's idolatry. That is idolatry. He's not in a piece of bread. Those are representative of Him. They're symbolic of Him. He's teaching truth through it. But they are not Him. So Abel's offering was not of works. His offering exposed the error of false religion. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. And it says, And by it he being dead yet speaketh. Abel still speaks. How? Through his offering that he made, that it was by faith, and this is how you approach God, because without faith it's impossible to please God. It's Nothing's ever changed. There is no different plan of salvation. It's all trusting in God, Amen. trusting in Jesus Christ, trusting in what God has said. Now, granted, I'll give you that at the time of Abel, they didn't understand everything about Jesus Christ, but they knew there was a promised Redeemer, a promised one that was going to, you know, bruise Satan's head to come. And by faith, they were looking forward to that and giving a blood sacrifice. They were believing what God said. And this is what on Wednesdays when we talked about, you know, we believe in, in dispensations, but not dispensational salvation. Okay, this was the, the requirement that was for them. They didn't understand everything about Jesus, but, but God told them, bring an animal sacrifice. And by faith, they had to do that. It's always, salvation has always been by faith. Or through faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. Okay, that's always how it's been. And, and you read through Hebrews chapter 11, and it says, By faith, Abraham. By faith, Noah. By faith, Moses. By faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. That's how it's always been. And that's still how it is. It's never changed. It's never going to change. That is God's plan of salvation is to trust me. To believe me. And this is what Abel did, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Why? By his faith, by his actions. His actions proved his faith. And that's what James talks about, because I can't see somebody's faith as God can see it. And people say, you can't see my heart. Yes, to a degree you're right. I can't see it like God sees it. I don't know what you're thinking and what you're feeling. I can't even know my own heart. My own heart can deceive me. So I can't see that. But what I can see... And what he did by which he obtained witness, and by, by, uh, by it he being dead yet speaketh, what I can see is someone's actions. And their actions say, ah, that's what they believe. See, because you being here today testifies of what you believe. It's a witness. You being here today is a witness against what you believe. Do you realize that? 
You being here says, I don't care what the governor says. The governor doesn't get to dictate to me what we can and can't do. I believe God. I love God. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to follow God. Therefore, I'm going to be here. You're bearing witness about what you believe. Now, you could tell me that outside of here, and I say, oh, okay, that's what they say they believe. That sounds good. But I don't really know it until I see you show up here. So a lot of people can say, well, I'm just going to follow God. I'm going to believe God. And yet, where are they at? Why are they shutting down their churches? They're showing us what they believe. Now, again, let me say, I don't think that everybody that shut down their services is, is, is fearful of man and, and disobedient to God. But I think the vast majority of them are. Okay? And again, if you, if you go ask anyone, they're not going to say, well, yes, I'm a compromiser. Yes, I fear man. I don't fear God enough. And I did this out of fear. Some of them might. You might find an honest person that is struggling with it. I'm not saying that's not there. So, Abel's offering exposed the error of false religion, and it was not of works. He obtained witness that he was righteous through his actions, which evidenced his faith. You're the same way. Your actions evidence your faith. It evidences what is there. Okay? And we have to remember that just because someone talks the talk does not mean that that's truly what they are. Their actions will dictate to you what they believe. Everybody. Every one of us. We can't get away from that. Our actions are going to dictate what we believe. What we will do. We have to remember that. We can't lose sight of that. Um, I say especially in the, the era and society in which we live, I'm talking in regards to, to church and us looking at things such as, how many of you are going to be very cautious if you lived in Europe in the 1500s? How many of you are going to be much more cautious if you're going to join a New Testament church? I mean, yeah, I know I would be. Why? Because, man, as soon as I get baptized, you're a marked man or woman. You're marked, and that could mean your death. Your baptism could mean not just that I'm dead to myself and alive unto Christ, because that's there, but the reality of that is much more in your face, that I truly am dead to self and alive to Christ, because this truly could mean my physical death for me just going in those waters and being baptized in a New Testament church. You're going to be much more cautious about that. So I say, that as we look at this, this issue of faith being observed, it's so much more important today because we don't face that. We're not facing persecution of that sort. And I praise God that when this whole thing with the coronavirus hit and everyone started shutting their churches down, we're the same size. We haven't changed. Everyone that was here before is still here now in regard to the coronavirus. I thank God for that. Amen. Now, if it gets worse or got worse, I wonder what would have happened. I don't know. But I hope we would be like, I'm still going to be here. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we'd be here. We may, you know, who thought that in our lifetime, I didn't think in my lifetime that I would honestly have to consider the Lord's church going underground. I never thought in my lifetime I'd have to consider that. I really didn't think that. I thought we had a better understanding of liberty in our nation than we actually do. And it, it breaks my heart, it saddens me, it angers me that this is where we're at as a nation, but it's true. So me saying us meeting, it doesn't mean necessarily that we would be meeting here if we had to go underground. It'd be at different people's houses or wherever so they can't track us down, trace us. But I'm thankful we don't live at a time like that. And this is why it's so important that what we do expect, we expect people to be faithful. Demonstrate 
your faith in God, your faith that you see His church as important, as really, you know, to me, they go, it goes hand in hand that God is number one in my life, then His church is number one in my life. Because this is His body. This is, we are Him. We're in Christ. He's the head. So to me, it goes hand in hand. They're both going to be together. If Jesus is my number one, then His church is going to be your number one. Amen. There's not going to be a separation from it. It's going to be one. Amen. So for us to expect that of people is not far-fetched. We're not living in the, in the days where if you get baptized, you're going to, it's going to cost you your life. You're going to be burned at the stake. Maybe you're tortured in prison for five years and then burned at the stake. That, ladies, your husband goes out um, uh, one day to work and he never comes home and you never know anything. You just assume that the authorities got him. By the way, I encourage you to read, if you've not read it yet, um, Tortured for Christ by Richard Wormbrown. You can probably get it for free if you look up Voice of the Martyrs. They will send a copy for free. Um, this happened in the 60s in communist Romania and by the way, a lot of the things that the communists did is looking pretty familiar to what's going on here today. But that's what happened to him when he got arrested. He just went out. I think he was going to a wedding to perform a wedding, and he never made it there, and nobody heard. They eventually found out because they had people part of, of their movement that were in every area, every facet of, of, of the government that, that would let them know, and they stayed working there. And by the way, some of those people, they, they were spit on by other Christians and looked down on as traitors because they worked for the communists. But really, they were there as spies, but they had to play the part. And they couldn't, like, really, yes, they were faking it, but they couldn't, like, tell people that, well, no, I'm just here as a, as a spy, because then it would blow their cover and they'd be in prison being beaten. But they were able to, to work for the communist government and help Christians as they could and get information and find things out. But anyway, they were able to finally get word back to his, his wife that he had been arrested, which is what she assumed, but she didn't know. And she got arrested as well, and they broke into her house in the middle of the night and took her. And they just left their son to die because that's what happened, because you couldn't take in a Christian in those under communist government, because then you'd be arrested. But there were people that would take care of him, and he did live on the streets and things like that. But this is the stuff that happened, but it really costs something to follow Jesus Christ. And we don't have that today. But it, it, it's not that far off. It really isn't that far off. And as we look at these things, it shouldn't be a big deal for us to say, no, we expect someone, you want to be a member here, then actually be a member. Because no one's going to, you know, flippantly consider being a member if it means it's going to cost you going to prison to, to be baptized into this body. No one's going to say, well, yeah, I'll do it. Okay, maybe. And then not be committed to this thing. So we have to understand that we should expect people to be committed to this. If you want to be a part of what we are, then be committed to it. Be committed to the Lord. Be committed to be a follower of Jesus Christ. That's what we should expect that. And it'll be evidenced through our actions. That tells everyone what we believe. All right. So we'll pick up next time looking at Noah's Ark.